Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Swami Vilahali, uh, one of the Gina representative. Uh, Gina is an online educational platform that we formed by a group of uh, Indian nurses to enhance uh, nursing education and practice in India. We started since last year. Um, today we have a session on a COVID-19 uh, management uh, of patients, uh, management of COVID-19 patients uh, with non-invasive ventilation. Uh, we have an excellent presenter with us. Uh, name is Rosalyn. I'm proud to say that she was one of my colleagues. We used to work with her in Ma uh, Manipal. Uh, she's currently working as an advanced clinical nurse practitioner in NHS uh, within UK in the emergency department. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping rules for the uh, participants. If you have any questions, uh, please do type it in the chat box. We will address all the questions at the end of the session. And those who are unable to join, if you have anybody asking you for the link, please advise them to join by uh, YouTube because we have limited entries on the Zoom. Uh, so we are also on, online, uh, live on YouTube, as well as Facebook. They can type the questions as well there. Uh, we can address all those questions at the end. Uh, Rosalyn, welcome to the uh, Gina group. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Swami. And uh, I really wishing everyone a very good morning and good afternoon in India. And uh, thank you to the Gina team for giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge on patients managing, patients with COVID-19 to manage with non-invasive ventilation. And uh, I'm just going to start the session because the timing is very crucial. Um, so the main objective of this session is just having a very quick overview on the respiratory system and uh, how does the respiratory failure happens in COVID patients. And we will review a bit about principles of NIV and a bit of the BTS guidelines, which is a British Thoracic Society guidelines on managing patients with COVID and also general management of patients on NIV. Think about potential contraindications and complications on having patients on NIV. A very brief view on ABG, and we will have some clinical scenarios as well. I will briefly touch on OptiFlow. OptiFlow is a high flow nasal oxygen. Different area could be using different equipment. I will highlight it. These are the name of the equipments. And uh, in your area, you could be using a different machine uh, we will discuss about it later. As I said, just a quick overview on anatomy and physiology. So respiratory system is actually a mechanical process. The amount of air, it's all about volume and pressure. So the amount of air going into the thoracic cavity creates a bit of a pressure that helps you to open the lungs and open every millions and billions of alveoli what we have in our lungs. So. It is happening in two phases. You have an inspiratory system and inspiration and expiration. In inspiration, what happens? Your thoracic and uh, intercostal muscles and die from contracts. So your thoracic cavity increases in space. So increased volume of air is able to go in. Over and over again, I'm coming about volume and pressure. It is so very important that we understand about volume and pressure in the respiratory system. Hence the brief introduction on anatomy and physiology. In expiratory phase, what happens? The intercostal muscles relaxes and the diaphragm goes up. So you're able to expel all the inspiratory oxygen into the expiratory phase as a carbon dioxide. So again, I'm talking about volume because it is very, very crucial. As a bedside nurse, as a junior nurse in intensive care, I haven't got a clue what I was doing observations on. It's all the numbers I just was writing down. But on reflection, I wish someone had taught me in depth about respiratory system and how to manage a ventilated patient would have made such a big difference. But never mind, I, I was digging deep down to learn things on my own. And that's it. But we did learn all this in our school of nursing, but applying theory to practice, that's what is very, very important in uh, intensive care. And especially not just in intensive care, any part of nursing, but uh, uh, you have a more applied physiology in intensive care because you are caring for the sickest patient in the hospital. 
So few volumes to remember, tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air taken in or out. It can be an inspiratory tidal volume or expiratory tidal volume. When you're monitoring a patient in intensive care or a patient not just in ITU, because in, during COVID seasons, we were monitoring patients or we, are ma we were managing patients on NIV in a respiratory ward environment. In that situation where um, you will be monitoring NIV patients. So when you're monitoring a ventilated patients, predominantly we will be doing an expiratory volume, not an inspiratory volume. Obviously go by your guidelines, how your consultant or your team or in your hospital, how they are advising you to treat on. So tidal volume again is an amount of air expired during each respiratory breath. Now, ideally you want the tidal volume about seven mils per body weight. Say for example, if I weigh 60 kg, 60 times seven will be my tidal volume in an ideal world. When I am unwell, we are expecting about four to five mils per kg body weight. So if I weigh 60 kg, I more than enough, 300 mils of tidal volume is more than enough. That's what I'm trying to say. So what is minute volume? Minute volume is nothing but a respiratory rate times tidal volume. So just to be aware, these two volumes are very essential when you're managing an NIV patient. Hence, I'm focusing on this slide a little more. So again, that respiratory volumes can vary, depends upon the patient's size, age, sex, and the physical condition. Obviously, a young fit adult can have a good reserve, a good tidal volume. About 70 year old lady weighing about 40 kg, she may not have a good tidal volume. So you need to put lots of factors in place, but physical illness or the pneumonia itself can decrease your tidal volume because of the effort. Again, I will show you a few more slides on how this can be affected. So the residual volume is about 100 and 1,200 mils remains in the lungs, so your lungs is left open, that it doesn't get collapsed. One, two other slides I want to focus on is your expiratory, external respiration and internal respiration. When the doctors or the medical colleagues, when they do the ward rounds, they do talk about all this, but sometimes it looks like as if it is a foreign language. Not at all, if we understand the basic pathology, anatomy and physiology, we would be able to really nurse these patients in a very good standard. External respiration is nothing but an air gas, gas exchange between alveolar space and capillary bed, where your oxygen gets diffused from the alveoli to the capillary, and carbon dioxide gets diffused from the returned blood to the lungs, which is from the capillary bed, to the alveoli and gets expired during our expiration. So that is your external respiration. What is internal respiration? Internal respiration is what is happening at the tissue side. So right at the end, for example, if you're moving your hand, if you're doing some work, you need energy and oxygen and glucose into the cells. So at the tissue level where your oxygen is delivered to the tissues and it takes the carbon dioxide and returns all this carbon dioxide back to the pulmonary artery and to the uh, capillary bed for expiration. So the internal respiration is happening at the peripheries, at the organ level. External respiration is happening at the lung. So in a uh, picture-wise, you could see, hopefully, Gina, they would be able to have these uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations later, I take it. Yes. Thank you. Again, neural regulations, we all know the respiration is controlled uh, through a neural system. Again, I am not going to go in depth about a respiratory system alone can take about five days to talk about. I am not going in depth because my focus is mainly on non-invasive ventilation, but I was just whizzing through purely to have some basic understanding on anatomy and physiology. So what are the factors influencing the respiratory rate? It can be physical, emotional, and chemical factors. Physical factors is as simple as um, increased body temperature, exercise, talking, 
talking, I have to tell you. These NIV patients are so anxious. They want to talk, talk, talk. That is the time they want to say all the story around the world. When I am talking, I am holding my breath. I am not taking a breath. When I am pausing in between, I am taking a breath. The patients who are on NIV, they really need to focus on their breathing. So if the NIV patients are talking, please tell them they can talk in one word answer, yes or no. They no need to tell the whole history. Emotional factors, again, obviously anxiety and withdrawn. Either patients being anxiety will be breathing fast. Withdrawn patients could be hardly breathing or you may think that they are not breathing fast enough, but they are significantly depressed with possibly a recent bereavement or anything. And chemical factors can be a carbon dioxide, either increased carbon dioxide, again, causes a respiratory depression and hypoxia increases the um, respiratory rate. So there are lots of factors we need to consider or in patient in severe pain could be hyperventilated. So there are, could be lots of reasons why patients could be having a um, faster rate or a, a slower rate or having a shallow breath. So let's focus on respiratory failure. So what is respiratory failure? Respiratory failure is a syndrome where when there is a failure in the respiratory system where the gas exchange function is declined, either taking oxygen in or unable to eliminate the CO2. So either it is a hypoxia or hypercapnia. It can be a type one or type two respiratory failure. Just to give you a visual picture, you could see in a patient who had a pneumonia, um, you could see a healthy lung and B, you could see a normal alveoli. But you could see when an alveoli is affected with a pneumonia, how the uh, fluid or a pus or a mucus gets plugged in into this alveoli and where there is no oxygen and CO2 exchange is not taking place. And on the right side in that x-ray, this is a live patient whom I cared for. And you could see the uh, left lower lobe pneumonia, how it is localized patchy consolidation we have. On the left hand side, you could see if a patient with emphysema, how the normal airway should be, a patient with bronchi bronchiectasis, how their airway is, just to have a visual idea how inside the lungs uh, the images are. I just showed you in the previous picture how the localized uh, uh, pulmonary infiltration is there. But on the other picture, this is a typical patient with COVID. You have a bilateral patchy infiltration. So it threw out both air lungs and uh, it is a patchy infiltration like a cotton wool put on everywhere on the lung. It is a, uh, again, last year, real patient's chest X-ray it is. So what is type one respiratory failure? Type one respiratory failure is nothing but it is characterized by severe hypoxia. You could have a normal CO2, or in fact, it could be slightly lower because patient is hyperventilating because gasping for oxygen, they are hyperventilating and they are blowing out the CO2. So either it could be normal or it could be slightly lower, such as patients with asthma, pneumonia, ARDS, they will, uh, pneumonia and severe adult respiratory distress syndrome, these patients could have initial hypoxia, then they will go into hypercapnia as well. In initial stage, they will be in hypoxia. Or patient in pulmonary edema. In respiratory failure, type two respiratory failure, you have hypoxia as well as hypercapnia, where they are retaining the CO2, such as patients with uh, chest folded vomities, COPD, muscle weakness, or central depression. So in a COPD patient, they tend to have a hypercapnia because again, too much oxygen drives them to go into hypercapnia. So we got to be really, really careful. One other picture of it, where on the right hand side, you could see how the alveoli is beautifully covered with 
a network of capillaries, but in an emphysema patient where your dead space is increased and your alveoli is completely, um, the, the main branch of the bronchiole itself um, is constricted, it's narrowed, and also your alveoli is all um, collapsed or it is not like puffed up balloon, it is all collapsed and you don't have a much better oxygen exchange happening. So how could we recognize these patients? First sign is they would have an increased respiratory rate. Find out why they are having increased respiratory rate. Is the patient in pain? Is their oxygen level is satisfactory? Never rely on just oxygen saturation because possibly patient's peripheries is completely shut down. They don't have a good oxygen supply or blood supply to the peripheries and saturation probe is not picking up. So never rely on just a saturation probe. In such patients, best to have an arterial blood gas done. Uh, or patient's oxygen level is decreasing the saturation or in blood gas, or the oxygen requirements is climbing up and up and up. Patient is complaining of chest tightness and unable to take a deep breath. They are quite anxious, obviously early chest infections, pneumonia, or COVID signs, they are already anxious. Are they going to go home at all? So it is important that we reassure the patients if they are really anxious. Are they using accessory muscles? Are they able to speak in full sentences? If you are in respiratory failure or finding it difficult to breathe, we will not be able to speak in full sentences. So just check, are they having a broken sentence? Are they able to speak in full sentences? But these are just a cues to recognize. But in depth, in depth respiratory assessment is very, very essential. So just put in two, I always use IPPA, which is an inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Never be hesitant to auscultate the patient's chest. It is not the stethoscope is just for a doctor. As a nurse, please go find or request a doctor's stethoscope if you haven't got of your own and listen to the chest. So let's go with an inspection. First, look at the chest. What is, the, how, how, what is, is this patient sitting right upright, able to be in a good position to open that lung sufficiently? And what is the respiratory rate? Is the patient talking in full sentence? Is there a use of accessory muscle? Could you see that the chest is expanding equally or flail segment is nothing but during inspiration, your lung should get expanded. During expiration, it collapses, but in flail segment, it is opposite. So it happens predominantly due to any injury. So when you breathe in, usually that part of the lung actually sucking and instead of expanding, it goes inwards, opposite way. And during expiration, the lung actually instead of collapsing it expands so it goes completely opposite think about your normal inspiratory phase and expiratory phase it goes opposite is there any surgical scar did the patient have any cardiothoracic surgery need to remember in india patients if they had a tuberculosis earlier days in 50s 60s they all had a lobectomy done so is there any scar of lobectomy so that to look for paradoxical breathing. And as I said, never trust your saturation probe. Don't rely on it all the time. That's what I'm trying to say. For a trend, it is okay. But uh, never rely on it all the time, especially when they are acutely unwell. Palpation. Is a patient has got a sub, subcutaneous emphysema. Subcutaneous emphysema is like a, um, a bubble paper. If you feel the bubble paper, how it is, feel, put the hands on the patient's chest and feel for it. Is there a reproducible tenderness? Reproducible tenderness is when you're pressing on the patient, the patient is experiencing pain by you doing that palpation. So that is a reproducible tenderness. That could be secondary to infection or it could be secondary to any injury. Do have a feel. Is the trachea in central? Somebody is talking. Is the trachea in central? Is the chest is expanding equally, and is there any deformity? Sorry, Rosie, one second. May I request all the audio, all the participants to go on mute, please? No, I, I will do it. Okay, okay, thank you. 
I don't but know the, internet issues I think but I can hear it very clearly yeah from my end also like a stream status showing is good in anal- youtube analytics yeah even though yeah. from from my side as well I can hear the in youtube uh, there's no issues but I don't know why the other people are having a problem mm-hmm. yeah uh, audio is clear here uh, the, mm-hmm. I'm getting feedback that others are here able to hear I think guys some those of you who are having problems mm-hmm. can you uh, uh, log in via the youtube and probably that, try that again or you even log off and log in again well, the only problem is if you log off uh, there may be other participants who are waiting so you may not be able to log in again so try the youtube link in case if you can't get uh, get back into zoom meeting uh, i'll put the uh, youtube link on the uh, on the chat box already thank okay you. sir okay thank you thank you it is it's very clear please continue i think Yeah, sorry, Rosalind. Carry on. Sorry, Rosalind. No problem. Apologies if no, someone Rose. unable to hear me, but I am on the maximum volume, and your guys' volumes are really going too loud for me. So I am on my maximum volume. Okay. Uh, just going back on palpation. So we talked about inspection, palpation, and uh, and also you would be able to keep your hands on the patient's chest and feel for rapidly secretions. sometimes if the especially patients with copd and emphysema or chronic smoker you would be able to feel the secretions before even putting your stethoscope and listen for auscultation percussion percussion is nothing very very difficult all you're trying to do is keep your hand on the patient's chest on the middle finger just to tap and see so where do you tap you want to consider the mid clavicular region and come into the j shape all the way you come in through the mid clavicular region going to the mid axillary region and you just listen for the resonance is it hyper resonance or is it dull normal resonance you will understand the more and more you practice on percussion you will understand hyper resonance causes potentially secondary to pneumothorax so dullness possibly secondary to effusions or consolidation again auscultation i have mentioned here where from mid clavicular region to the mid axillary region mid axillary line um where you listen to both the sides alternatively and listen for any added sound say for example expiratory wheeze it is a lower respiratory sound strider is an upper respiratory sound or is there a crackles or crepitations is it a fine crackles or coarse crackles the more and more you listen to the patient's chest you will get the hang of uh, understanding these different um uh, what do you call sounds my one other recommendation is please go to youtube on geeky medics or geeky meds Uh, they are uh, run by actually a medical students fourth year fifth year medical students they go in depth about assessment not just respiratory assessment i use it on a uh, few uh, assessments so please do go on the youtube and see so how are we going to manage so we know how to recognize we know how to um, assess the patient now we need to create a management plan now there are lots of management plan but my focus is mainly on niv on this session so you could do a blood investigations on these covid patients for many thing 
you could have an imaging it's basic chest x-ray is good enough to understand uh, is this patient has got a bilateral patchy infiltrations doesn't require that all the patients have to have a ct chest ct chest could be considered if you are or ctpa can be considered if you are suspecting for a pulmonary embolism if not it is not require every patient have to go for a ct other general um, management can be antibiotics steroids now these are potential managements what we had done in england again your own hospital will have your own guidelines please do follow that okay and use of dexmethasone be quite a lot of uh, patients in second wave we were using or even first wave we were using dexamethasone dexamethasone side effect is hyperglycemia again a tight control of blood sugar is very very essential if your patient's blood sugar is high please do check your ketones make sure that the patient is not in dka so there are lots of management things to be considered i cannot tell you about fluid management in first wave we all were learning through this covid journey in initial stages we were thinking covid patients have to be kept dry and many of these patients were going into acute kidney injury and going into hemofiltration because giving too much fluid in patients with ARDS or severe pneumonia is going into pulmonary edema and uh, end up having a high ventilator pressures but going into AKI now realize that no patient requires IV fluids never keep them on dry so it is important that you review the patient's fluid management on a daily basis and consider especially patients on NIV they will be hyperventilating through that NIV mask and they are extremely dry breathing in breathing out this dry air so it is essential that we maintain adequate fluid so our focus mainly is on respiratory support so what we were doing on these patients uh, on covid we were having a specific target saturation i know how in india we are going through at the moment a uh, de decline oxygen supply as in uk as well we went through that but we had a clear strategy how we are going to manage these patients so patients with uh, no history of copd we were targeting only 92 to 96% of oxygen saturation or oxygen level uh, in the arterial blood gas in a copd patient we were tolerating 88 to 92 okay. sometimes even 85% we didn't uh, go anything higher than that patients were kept on nasal cannula anything between 1 to 5 liters when we did have a oxygen deprivation we had or decline in supply we had a, pay, a machine called uh, oxygen concentrator so it was sucking the room air and concentrating <laughs> oxygen up to 5 <laughs> liters nasal cannula we were able to give oxygen through oxygen concentrator through nasal cannula and our patient requires a face mask or non rebreathe mask patients with a copd we were very much strict on venturi mask or we used to prone the patient so though patient is self ventilated though the patient is on niv we prone the patient so that um uh, we were able to increase the oxygenation on these patients so we avoided having patient being ventilated so as i said to you in the first wave every patient was we didn't want to leave the patient in respiratory distress longer so early intubation was done then we realized actually the more and more patients getting intubated the increase in itu capacity was going high and high we were really really getting work like uh, struggling on icu beds that resources were overstretched so we started using more niv in the second wave the respiratory wards were very busy than intensive care i have to admit because many patients were managed with a cpap or bipap or high flow nasal oxygen we were quite cautious on using high flow oxygen i have to say but certain patients we did use high flow oxygen 
a machine called OptiFlow be used. Obviously, different places, different equipments will be used. So the main focus is on non-invasive. Let's focus on that. So non-invasive ventilation is a provision of ventilatory support through the patient's upper airway, either through a mask or a little nasal cannula. So there are different types of masks. You have a nasal mask, face mask, or kind of a nasal flow, you could see. A divers mask, we say the E is a, we call it divers mask, the whole face is covered, or the hub, where the, the hood, where it is like a space hood, you could see the whole head is covered, um, where uh, you're able to give a high flow oxygen, or a pressure is able to be created on that. Use of NIV, it is actually a one of the treatment for a uh, COVID patient. It is not, or it's not the only one treatment, it is one of the treatment. We are able to hold the pressures and uh, we are able to buy time uh, until we are able to intubate a patient, able to create a safe environment. Uh, it is a trial before intubation, that's correct. Some patients avoided going intubated ventilated. Um, for some patient, this could have been a ceiling of treatment. I know it is a hard subject to discuss, but it is essential that when a patient is being started on NIV, before even starting on NIV, we need to have an escalation plan. What is the maximum treatment we have planned for this gentleman or a lady? And uh, for certain patients like uh, end-stage COPD, if we get them intubated and ventilated, we will never be able to extubate these patients. So uh, we need to think about the best interest of the patients and their quality of life as well. So we will consider possibly for some patients, NIV being the ceiling of treatment. Or post-extubation, in order to avoid reintubation, electively for 24 to 48 hours, we will face the, put the patient on NIV. The aim is to decrease the work of breathing, increase the tidal volume, increase the, or improve the alveolar ventilation and decrease the respiratory rate. We have two types of NIV settings, which is a CPAP, which is a continuous positive airway pressure, or a BiPAP, which is a bi-level positive airway pressure. We use different equipments, Philips. At the moment, either we use BiPAP vision or Trilogy. But obviously, in your setting, please do find out what kind of a machine you use. It is according to that. But the basic principle is the same. The observations are still the same. So what is a CPAP? CPAP is actually a continuous positive airway pressure. I just want to put it in simple terms. What happens when you put a tight mask on your face? There is a constant blow of air going on the patient's face. So when the patient is breathing in, it is okay. When the patient have to breathe out, they have to breathe out against this positive flow. That is the hard work. When they breathe out, there is a degree of pressure is created. That pressure is CPAP. CPAP is nothing but is a PEEP, which is a positive end expiratory pressure. That PEEP actually splints the alveoli, keep those balloons, millions and billions of balloons, what we have in our lungs, it splints the alveoli and keeps it open. And that's where your oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange takes place. The more the oxygen goes in, their work of breathing comes down, you are able to have an alveolar recruitment and improve your oxygenation and decrease your hypoxia. So the one-lay principle you have to remember is continuous positive airway pressure is a constant blow of oxygen mixed with air. When the patient is breathing in is okay, breathing out, they have to breathe out against this positive flow that creates a pressure, that is CPAP. That is what is helping the patient's alveolar recruitment. Indications for CPAP on type one respiratory failure or patient is in pulmonary edema, just a simple atelectasis in the early stage of pneumonia, patients with fractured rib or flyle segment. Now, can I tell you something on that? Any patients going on NIV, first and foremost, we need to consider 
a chest X-ray, make sure that this patient doesn't have a pneumothorax. I have got cautiously put there fractured rib. Fractured rib hopefully doesn't have a pneumothorax that needs to be considered, or it can be considered before intubation or post extubation. So we can avoid intubation, avoid early intubation, and also avoid reintubation. As I said to you, first and foremost, before even starting a patient on NIV, we need to know what is the escalation plan and always consider medical therapy before getting the patient on NIV as again, a chest X-ray and starting uh, CPAP pressures. CPAP has got only one pressure, which is your P, and you want to consider anything between um, four to five centimeters to start with. You and me, as a normal healthy adult, we have about 2.5 to 4 centimeters of feet. And we have healthy lungs. We would be able to breathe. And we are able to open our alveoli with a good amount of volume what we take in and able to create a pressure to open these. But these patients with COVID or any pneumonia, they are unable to open this alveoli that we are giving this pressure. And you could increase the pressure either by one or two centimeters. Always remember, adjust the pressure to reach the required tidal volume. When you insert the pressure, you're able to create a volume and that is what you measure on that NIV machine. So you're able to get that volume. And don't go on increasing the oxygen. First, titrate, get the adequate when, uh, tidal volume and minute volume, then you consider increasing the oxygen. Monitor the patient very closely. And uh, in, CO, in COVID patients, again, depending upon the size, very easily sometimes we started the CPAP at eight to 10 centimeters because they, they have got bilateral patchy infiltrations. Their alveoli, they're completely filled with fluid and pus and mucus. So we have to have, use a high pressure to open these alveoli. Again, what we noted is most of these patients had high BMI. So requiring a bit of a higher pressure to start on. In a normal days, I would have started only on five centimeters of water pressure, but COVID patients, I ended up starting on eight to 10 centimeters of um, uh, uh, water pressure. And also first 20 to 40, 24 to 48 hours, minimize the amount of break. Yes, patients will be anxious. They feel they are a bit suffocated, reassure them, stay with them. And it is very, very important that you minimize the break. Break only for some nebulization. That time, try to give them some drink to drink. Don't give a three-course meal. They will not be able to tolerate a small, frequent food, but high-calorie food. That's what we try to consider. And repeat ABGs and check, up, check for pressure areas. I tell you, the number of patients having a nasal bridge pressure ulcer, hence we consider using a diver's mask, which is a mask covers the whole face, or we consider a hood, which covers the whole head, which is to prevent pressure ulcer. And they are able to talk better on those things, but don't let them talk too much. How do you know this is working? The work of breathing decreases, decreases the respiratory rate. You could see the ABG is improving. So what is BiPAP? So we talked about CPAP. BiPAP is bi-level positive airway pressure. So you have two pressure on it, which is nothing but an IPAP and EPAP. IPAP is your inspiratory positive airway pressure. EPAP is expiratory positive airway pressure. EPAP is nothing but a PEEP. So remember, if you're moving a patient from CPAP, now the patient is going into hypercapnia, you can change the patient into BiPAP. In BiPAP, what you have is how to set up. That's what most of the time we get worked up or we highly rely on medical staff. It is not necessary. Only medical staff have to um, change. Obviously, please do follow your guidelines in intensive care, in uh, a &E or in respiratory ward. As nurses, as a senior nurses, we would be going to start. We change the settings. We manipulate, we don't wait for the doctors to come and do it. Please do follow your guidelines, what is practiced in your respiratory ward or in your high dependency or ITU. But if you are in a position to change, what you would do is from CPAP to BiPAP, 
your EPAP is nothing but your PEEP or CPAP, okay? If you started your CPAP was at eight centimeters, moving to BiPAP, you will set your EPAP at eight centimeters. The difference between your IPAP and EPAP is nothing but your pressure support. You want to have a minimum pressure support of eight to 10 centimeters to start in especially COVID patients. So if your EPAP is at eight, I would start my IPAP as at possibly 16 and wait, look at the patient's tidal volume, okay? Are you able to achieve the tidal volume what is required for that patient? Every patient is differing. So it is approximately five mils per kg body weight. So if a patient weighs 60 kg, 300 mils would be an ideal tidal volume for that specific patient in COVID. Obviously, if a patient has got a significant high BMI, you go by the ideal body weight. A patient weighing 150 kg, it is unrealistic, you would be able to reach 750 mils of tidal volume. So in such patients, you would go by the ideal body weight. Again, um, IPAP helps improve the ventilation, decreases the work of breathing, increases the tidal volume. That if you want, if the oxygen is satisfactory, keep the EPAP. It's only your CO2 is an issue. Keep increasing your IPAP and create the more difference. Increasing the IPAP maybe one or two centimeters at a time. The higher the difference is, the better the volume you will be able to create. The better the volume you create, you're able to expel the CO2 better. So that's how you would be able to correct the CO2. EPAP is mainly, as I said before, prevents the collapse of alveoli, flushes the oxygen, provides the PEEP, and decreases the oxygen requirement. When you would consider in type 2 respiratory failure, COPD, Obstructive sleep apnea patients in COVID, usually obstructive sleep apnea will be, patients will be using only a CPAP at home, uh, or I don't know in India, but predominantly in UK patients have got a CPAP at home. But if they had gone in COVID, coming to hospital, they will be using a BiPAP. Any chronic muscular disformities or cystic fibrosis. Again, um, only consider starting an IV once the medical treatment is achieved and uh, consider not just start the NIV by using just a saturation oxygen in the saturation probe, have a confirmed ABG, monitor the patients closely and aim for a pH anything just above 7.35 and saturations we were accepting anything between 85 to 92. Again, don't go on increase oxygen. First adjust the pressure setting according to the tidal volume, then consider titrating the oxygen. In an ideal world, you would start the BiPAP at 10 over four, but in a COVID patients, especially patients on a CPAP on a higher pressure, when you move over to BiPAP, as I said to you before, just cross over to the EPAP, what you had on your CPAP, and consider about eight centimeters above that EPAP is your IPAP. And uh, you would consider for nebulization, you would stop the NIV, unless it is an ultrasonic nebulizer, then you would consider doing it. One other kind consideration is you could consider ramp setting or rise time. Ramp setting is nothing but you could consider five minute ramp, 10 minute ramp, which means you would have had an CPAP or say we will talk about CPAP of eight centimeters. It takes five minutes or a 10 minutes, depending upon your RAM setting, it takes that long to reach that eight minutes, eight centimeters. Once it reached eight centimeters, it will be consistently in that eight centimeters. So it is kinder to the patient. So they, when they put the face mask, it is not suffocating for them. That's what I'm trying to say. The good practices, observing these patients and having an NIV observation, respiratory rate, tidal volume, minute volume, peak inspiratory pressure. Again, the higher the pressure, we are potentially causing a barotrauma pneumothorax. So it is very, very important that we uh, monitor the peak pressure on these patients and saturation, monitor the observation. These patients having an 
on NIV causes an increased intraparasitic pressure. So the venous return decreases. So patient can be cardiovascularly compromised, having a low blood pressure. Make sure these patients are adequately hydrated so that they are not dehydrated, that they are having a cardiac instability. Humidification is so essential because you're blowing so much of dry air, either giving a good hydration or consider using an NIV machine with humidification. Sometimes we do consider mild sedation. These sedations are used only in an intensive care setting, not in the ward respiratory environment, like dexmedetomidine or remifentanil. Regular nebulizations consider, oh, we will consider NIV and a high flow oxygen as an aerosol generating procedure. Patients with COVID, you need to have a strict personal protective equipment, PPEs and consider your pressure area care. When would you not consider NIV? When they have a facial deformities, burns, having an upper airway obstruction, pneumothorax, hemoptysis, or unable to maintain their own airway because of low GCS. So just be careful. And also if a patient is vomiting and excessive secretions, when they vomit, considering this positive flow, highly likely the patients will aspirate, regurgitate and aspirate. So you really, really want to consider NIV patients having sometimes an NG tube, especially elderly generation, having an NG tube is essential so that uh, we are not um, bloating the tummy and getting this aspiration. Complications of NIV, mask-related complications such as a discomfort, air leak, pressure area on, on the nasal bridge, allergic reaction to the material it can be. Difficult to communicate. That is a hard task where the patients want to say something or we want to say something they can't hear because of this all forced oxygen going in. Patients can end up having a pneumothorax thorax, or gastric distension, mucus plugging. There are lots of potential complications. Please read through. I, I'm coming, I'm a bit conscious about the time as well. So I'm just a bit rushing, but these slides are available. Please do go through. When would you consider starting this? You would have a clear management plan. You have to have a chest X-ray, ABG, have a previous medical plan before starting the NRV. I don't know how your practice is. Ideally, in this country, we have to have an NIV prescription and uh, gain, explain the procedure to the patient, gain the patient's consent, keep the patient in an upright position, not slumped in bed, putting a slapping an NIV on. No, keep the patient right upright, that in a better position. And uh, is this patient uh, able to uh, tolerate the NIV? It is of no use, patient constantly ripping off the mask and no compliance is gained. So just do try to get the compliance of the patient. You could consider different masks depending upon the size and how you would be able to fit. Again, if you go on the Philips website or Respironics, it is given in detail how to apply an NIV mask. We talked about already how to monitor the patient and be aware of barotrauma, so quick, not only just starting, you have to have an in-depth in respiratory assessment, consider reviewing these patients every four hourly with the in-depth IPPA, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. However, hourly observations are required on these patients. And following that, you've got to have an ABG done. Not hourly ABG, once established pressure, monitoring, maintaining the oxygenation, then you can consider later ABGs. We talked about, again, earlier itself, uh, reassessing the patient, how to arrange the pressure settings. Quick view on OptiFlow. OptiFlow, we don't encourage very much on COVID patient purely because it blows oxygen everywhere. It consumes high oxygen, but in certain patients, it is very useful, especially people who are very, very anxious and claustrophobic not able to tolerate the NIV mask. You can give 21% to 100% oxygen on this. And however, uh, one lay maximum you could achieve is about five centimeters of water pressure CPAP. And uh, this 
is quite difficult to achieve on bariatric patients. You may not be able to consider. However, this is the best comfortable way of delivering the CPAP if the patient requires only minimal pressure. However, it consumes high oxygen. When we were declining in oxygen supply, we were not using on all patients on OptiFlow. There are different size of nasal cannula available for OptiFlow. Again, if you go into Fisher Pickles website, at the end of the slide, you have a reference list. Please do visit those references. And Fisher Pickle website, they have an online um, video session. Supports respiratory system, type one respiratory failure, it could be used. It's a patient comfort is the best on OptiFlow. Decreases the dead space because of this. Uh, how do you know this is working? It decreases the respiratory rate, increases the oxygenation, patient becomes much easier to breathe, and there is no use of accessory muscle, and you have a much better synchrony on the ventilation. So these are the signs that OptiFlow is working. In the other way, if it is going, it is not working. Don't wait for this OptiFlow for longer. In one hour, you should see the change around. If it is not working, don't keep the patient on OptiFlow longer purely because you're just wasting oxygen. So especially when we have oxygen crisis, this is not the best way to do it. When will you not consider, again, similar principle as an NIV? If you go on a fisher Pakel's website, you have a good video session. Online learning is there. Please do visit that. A quick discussion on ABG. The five parameters we or five steps to understand the ABG is what is the pH? Is the patient acidotic? Is the pH is within limit or it is less? Anything less than 7.35 is acidotic. Anything above 7.45 is alkalosis. Is the patient, okay, these all are in different units from India. I am not sure. Please do refer to your own uh, local units and normal parameters. Is the, first and foremost, just don't look at the numbers. Okay, look at the patient, how he or she is. Depending upon the patient, then you would consider, is the patient hypoxic? So all those five steps, pH, PO2, PCO2, bicarbonate, HCO3, and base deficit or base excess, however you call it. And take these five readings and assess whether is it appropriate or is a patient in type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure. We know type 1 is hypoxic, type 2 is hypercapnic, and patient could have hypoxia as well. So just coming to a quick uh, scenarios, I have a 62 year old lady present to ED recess with a two day history of shortness of breath. She has got extensive cardiac history, including previous MI. She is using accessory muscle. On auscultation, she had bilateral fracos. These were her observations. Her blood pressure is low, heart rate is high, increased respiratory rate. She is saturating only 87% on 15 liters non rebreathe mask. And you could see on 15 liter rebreathe mask, these are the oxygens. Uh, PO2 is only eight. Though patient has got a normal pH, PO2 is only eight. And this is on 15 liters non rebreathe mask. So this patient isn't requiring oxygen. Is this patient in? type one or type two respiratory failure. Obviously you're not in a position to answer me. This patient is in type one respiratory failure. We were able to turn around this lady with just a CPAP. Mr. Gibson is a known COPD and in respiratory distress using accessory muscle. And uh, he says to me that he is having a productive cough. Again, he is a known COPD patient but it is a mucopurulent. Vital signs are these. He was on venturi mask because he is a known COPD. We really control the oxygen there. But look at his pH, it's 7.25 and he is retaining CO2. Though his PO2 is nine, 
He is on 40% oxygen. He is in type 2 respiratory failure. We weaned his oxygen down to 28% and we were maintaining his saturation at 84, 85% to maintain his pH. 35 year old young man presented with COVID pneumonia. A couple of days ago, he was tested positive with shortness of breath. He was saturating 91%. He was hyperventilating 42 breaths per minute. And that was his ABG. And uh, at this stage, we were in, he was specifically on venturi mask because we really want to titrate the oxygen because we were on oxygen crisis here but we were able to turn around with early starting on CPAP. We didn't put him on OptiFlow, we put him on CPAP. A 68 year old lady presented with a bad chest infection. She feels her chest is bad. She was saturating 87% and she's morbidly obese. Trust me, she was a very, very big lady. Didn't mean to be disrespected. She was really sitting on the whole chair. Bariatric chair is fully occupied. We nursed her all through in bariatric chair, not in a bed, because she, we need to keep her upright. And that's the only way we were able to keep her upright. And uh, again, this lady, we managed just with the NIV. We didn't go to intubate. We managed to successfully discharge her. So in summary, on NIV, again, please go through this slide in detail. Um, uh, what we discussed, I put it in one place so you could go through the this one picture alone, keep it as a screenshot in your mobile. You would be able to refer all the time. Everything is in just one page. These are my references. You would be able to visit any of these papers or guidelines. I'm so sorry, I rushed through quite quickly. I am conscious about the time as well. And I meant to finish at least 10 minutes early. I just got overrun, apologies. I'm open to any questions. Uh, Rosalind, that was a brilliant presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was really uh, very well informed and quite comprehensive. Uh, it refreshed my memories of working in respiratory ward about <laughs> 10 years ago now. Uh, fighting with the respiratory doctors. I mean, obviously, these are challenging circumstances. Uh, both we, we've been through this uh, uh, challenging circumstances, guys, those who are in India. Uh, I know it is challenging for you now. Uh, uh, I know there is a shortage of beds in the hospitals, uh, especially intensive care beds. Uh, most of these patients can be managed in the ward level as long as you got the right gears and right resources. Uh, obviously, uh, Rosalind has given uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, guidelines and instructions on how to manage these patients. Uh, we are happy to uh, share any of the information that you would like. Please do uh, put a request in our by email or by or in our WhatsApp group. If any of you want to share the uh, want us to send the slides, we're happy to do that with your permission, Rosalind. If that's okay. No problem. Absolutely, I'm more than happy. Thank you. Thank you. And, and if you, any of you have any questions, uh, those who are logged in on the YouTube, please type it in the uh, YouTube chat box. And those who are logged in on the Zoom, please type in or unmute yourself. Uh, Suresh, if that's possible. I, uh, yes, yes, if they raise their hand, uh, I can unmute them. And again, other side, uh, can we exit the uh, yeah, yeah. Screen, screen sharing, please? Yeah, Rosalind, if you could uh, uh, stop uh, screen sharing, yeah. Oh, sure. Stop share. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So if any any of you want to ask a questions, please raise your hand uh, or to type it in the chat box, please. Thank you. Somebody asking called Mantu Karangi. Maybe. There was okay. Hello. Naresh. Good morning, man. Good morning. Ma'am, my two questions are there. One is dexamethasone can be given to the patient who all are on aspirin treatment, aspirin tablet. Yes, uh, we had given patients with uh, aspirin. However, uh, obviously you want to have a PPA protection, either omeprazole or lansoprazole. Uh, 
uh, as long as you have a proton pump inhibitor protect, um, given along with aspirin and dexamethasone, yes. However, patients who are having dexamethasone, as I said, very close monitoring on blood sugar. These patients go high up on the blood sugar that they ended up having uh, intermittent novorapid or despite increasing blood sugar, they even go on an insulin infusion. But there is no contraindication that you can't give along with aspirin. There's a question. Hey, the, there's a question. Uh, the Sarif, sorry, Sarif, sorry, if you sir. are allowing me to, I can raise the two more questions. The uh, one more okay. is, sir, sucking, uh, sorry, this ox nebulizer machines can be used for supplying the oxygen. As we saw the some videos, viral videos, without any medicine, this nebulizer machine we can use to provide the oxygen to the patient when the oxygen shortage is there. You mean, I think okay. you're referring to concentrator, right? Yes, sir, oxygen is the oxygen okay. saturation, sir. Okay, nebulizer machine is actually, if you put a liquid, it turns the liquid into an aerosol, okay? In a vaporized form. That's all it is doing. But nebulizer machine is not providing oxygen. There is a different machine called oxygen concentrator that takes the oxygen from the atmospheric air, concentrates the oxygen from 21 person, increasing the oxygen concentration, and that delivers a patient. But I have never come across, and I want, don't want to give you a false information, that uh, nebulizer machine, I have not come across giving you an oxygen. We have an oxygen concentrator which concentrates the oxygen and increases the oxygen delivery. At atmospheric pressure, you have 21% oxygen. That This machine takes the oxygen from the atmosphere, concentrates, and delivers. I don't know about nebulizer. Sorry. Fine, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it definitely doesn't give the oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a question on the chat box. After vaccination, uh, people are developing COVID-19 infection. Could you explain? Okay. Um, after vaccination, you have 21 days. Still, your body is not fully immune to the vaccine. Still, within 21 days, you are prone to get infection, which is COVID. Now, if this patient person got exposed to someone who had COVID despite having vaccination, if it is within 21 days, yes, they can get COVID. I'm saying yes. But if it is after 21 days, you have a 95% protection depending upon the vaccine. Pfizer obviously says higher protection, so as AstraZeneca. You have uh, what is called COVID shield. COVID which shield. Is, yeah, COVID shield which is AstraZeneca one, Oxford one. I say it has got a higher protection. However, if it is within 21 days, you're not immunized, though you had a vaccine. Um, just to give a share of personal exam, uh, circumstances, I myself had the COVID vaccine on the 10th of January. <laughs> <laughs> the 7th of January and I developed COVID symptoms on the 10th because I was exposed to a patient while working in the ward. So there you go. But I didn't get, uh, the symptoms weren't that severe. Uh, so obviously that goes to show that the vaccine does work. Uh, so coincidentally, so that did happen. So. Uh, sir, one more question. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, as I from the rural place, the vaccination drive, whatever is taking place in Karnataka, some of people are not going to take the voluntary, they are not going to take the medicine just because of this side effect that yes. pain, whatever they are getting. Yes. Now, my question is that if the three days pain is there, if an uncontrollable pain is there, instead of the Dolo 650, any other medication is there to give the patient to control their pain? My, my question first is, uh, please do not give Dolo 650. Dolo has got ibuprofen. Having worked in allergy, uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatories can kick off and cause uh, allergic reactions. There was an incident recently in Bangalore. One of the anesthetists has injected uh, diclofenac injection uh, following a vaccination. She she developed uh, allergic symptoms and she went into she went into cardiac arrest. She had anaphylaxis. So 
So please make sure you just give plain paracetamol. Uh, Rosalind, do you want to add anything else? I would suggest the very same. Unfortunately, it is not an easy ride, okay? When the baby was small, when we were giving a BCG vaccine, baby didn't get up and say, Mommy, I am in pain. Please give me painkiller. Baby just cried, got on with the life, okay? It is as simple as that. When you have a vaccine and these vaccines are stored in minus 40, minus 50 degrees, it is not just a small um, injection what you're having. It is going to have a knock-on effect. Just got to brave it up and be um, tough enough and got to take the injection. Uh, make a regular paracetamol, but what we have to say is... Um, Every medication what you take it's, take its own has it has got its own side effect. I would really strongly advise not to take non steroidals like ibuprofen, diclofenac, anyone above fifty. Yeah. I, and uh, sorry. You know, just go, one go. quick correction. Uh, Dolo six fifty is just it's a paracetamol, no ibuprofen. So an okay. Indian brand. So that's completely safe to take. But okay. as long as because it's just a pure paracetamol, only the different strength of paracetamol. Okay. 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 Yeah. If it okay. is a paracetamol, they can it's take safety. up to four grams in 24 <laughs> hours. So you could take that one in uh, what do you call uh, four times daily. So every six hours, if you take a paracetamol, that should be more than enough because uh, absolutely fine. Or you could take two 500 milligrams of paracetamol, which is a one gram every six hourly. That is good enough as well. If Dolo C650, I take it, it is a paracetamol, only 650 milligrams. But your dosage can be up to one gram. Absolutely. So you can take two one gram paracetamol for every six hourly. So maximum you can take four grams in 24 hours. So you could consider that instead of Dolo 650. But my advice would be not to take non-steroidals. Uh, if your weight is above 50 kilos, you could take um, one, gram right. one gram That's of paracetamol. One gram of paracetamol. So 650 may be a subtherapeutic dose for your question. So perhaps that's why it's not working. So maybe you want to consider taking two of the paracetamol tablets. If someone tests positive for COVID, it is recommended that they have six to eight weeks before having a vaccine. That's correct. Six weeks four to six weeks, that's what is recommended here. Uh, uh, six to eight weeks is better to eight. avoid before eight. taking the COVID vaccine. Is it a bit of delay? Yeah, I think it's someone has logged into YouTube as well at the same time, so there's a buffering. Is it, is it Naresh? Is a question from you? Yes, sir. Do you have any questions, Naresh? No, sir. Yes, no. sir. Okay, yes, go, sir. go Go, go. for it. Sorry, in NIV patient, how to give an ablation, sir? NIV patients, you have, okay, in NIV, you have a high flow oxygen going. It is a constant pressure. If a patient who has gotten COVID positive on NIV, a, first and foremost, don't break the circuit when the machine is on. First, switch off the machine, then disconnect the mask. And if it is an ultrasonic nebulizer, you can give a nebulizer when the NIV is on. But if it is not an ultrasonic nebulizer, the NIV will not be uh, pushing that nebulized molecules into the patient's lungs. It will be just pushing and it will drop down just at the back of the throat. It will not go all the way down to the lungs. So the best is an NIV. Patient needs to be off NIV to give the nebulizer unless it is an ultrasonic nebulizer. Okay. And hopefully you have a T-tube in the mm -hmm. NIV so you're not constantly breaking the circuit. If a patient is COVID positive, please do not break the circuit when the machine is on, switch off the machine. It takes only a few seconds to unstrap the mask. So don't expose yourself for that COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, has anyone else got any questions? Otherwise? 
and i was just responding back to the question regarding dollar 650 what do you use as an alternative in uk we don't use the dollar 650 in common we use paracetamol in plain uh, sorry uh, can you can you highlight just briefly about the agps because people think that giving nebulizers you know can spread the infection of covid-19 so they need to be isolated room or a negative pressure room ideally uh, nebulization is not an aerosol procedure if it is via niv but if the patient is on niv it is a aerosol generated procedure full stop patient have to be in isolation if you are giving a nebulization with niv again patient is on niv it is an aerosol generated procedure if a patient is not on niv just a simple ma mask or a simple nasal cannula and you are giving a nebulization that is not an aerosol generated procedure procedure if a patient is intubated ventilated that is an aerosol generated procedure i repeat it if a patient is on niv or intubated ventilated that is an aerosol generated procedure and if you are giving a nebulization with a positive pressure on niv or an invasive ventilation it is an aerosol generated procedure but if a patient on a simple face mask and simple nasal cannula and you are trying to give a nebulization it is not an aerosol generated procedure is there any that, other yeah that you are right you are right rosalyn i think that's exactly what we 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 considered as well so we only the precaution that. is that uh, we recommend generally we recommend uh, a what what either it can be ultrasonic nebulization or the regular nebulization we recommend to use at least ffp2 mask in the presence even if it's not aerosol also but that's whereas right. yeah if it is an aerosol generated procedure patient the nurses and the doctors have and to be on a full ppe full ppe that's correct full yeah. ppe yeah. I, I think, think other th other things most of them consider. are getting confusion with the medication regarding the vax what is it uh, paracetamol. Okay. So again, in Indian setting, what happens is that if you take more than five hundred milligram, I don't remember. So five hundred is the max dose, and when they introduce the dose six fifty, that is the miss. That's highest strength of the paracetamol. So the concept oh. is the yeah. So the concept uh -huh. is that from so for decades, five hundred milligram is the maximum dose, QDS. That is five hundred milligram. Four times a day, four so that times. means two grams. So that worked most of the Indians. I don't know in what way it is works. I don't know, but it. I works. know. So I, I know. I know in what way it worked. The people used to be not uh, not over fifty kilos of those days. Yeah, no, not <laughs> only that one. The way they synthesized for like Australian, uh, so like Australian, uh, if they go Ab Aborigines, they can't uh, metabolize the alcohol, the way other uh, metabolize the alcohol. So it's a kind of genetic. <laughs> Okay. I don't know in what, uh -huh. but 500 milligram works for most of the people in India, even though more than 50 also. So when they introduced 650, they thought that there's a higher strength of paracetamol and they can take maximum four and anything beyond, it causes these some other issues. So that is a, uh -huh. I don't know in what way that concept has been created, I don't know. But uh, uh -huh. let me clear to everyone. So you can take one gram four times, that is maximum four grams over 24 hours. But if it's body response to 500 milligram or 650, that's fine. You take that much only. Right. Sorry, guys. Uh, can we allow Borama to ask a question? I think a uh, few times she tried to ask some question. Uh, sure, Bora, sure, sure. Uh, you can ask the question, please. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, my question is cardiac uh, problem patient can take vaccine if pacemaker they have been. Uh, yes, vaccination. Only if the people are allergic to multiple drugs, uh, we try. Swami would be the best person to say, allergic person. But uh, we consider cardiac patients are risk patients. And we try to vaccinate, the, vaccinate these patients early. And it is not a contraindication. And uh, unless this person has got a significant amount of drug reactions or multi allergic reaction to multiple drugs, then we will consider not to vaccinate. If not, cardiac patients are the first line priority to vaccinate. I hand over to Swami, that is his expertise. I think in general, thanks, thanks, Rosalind. Um, 
in general uh, there is no absolute contraindication for any uh, any of the existing vaccinations this one of the most common excipient that we come across in this vaccine is the macrogols so if there is anyone any history of known macrogol allergies if they have had a systemic known systemic reactions to macrogols then obviously it need to be done under caution in an allergic unit otherwise there is no absolute contraindication for any of the vaccinations probably if they have any history of allergic diseases you may want to observe them for a period of 1 hour post vaccination just to make sure there is no type 1 hypersensitivity that's what i would suggest okay so next uh, can we ask uh, christy kumari if you are on, if you are able to unmute and could you able to ask your question please christy is in the chat box uh, there you can answer that one is it christy did you say yeah yes that's right yes the question i just read um, if a person is having the infection of covid and not shown any symptom getting vaccinated will vaccinate vaccine aggravate um not really the thing is already if a person is having covid and being asymptomatic typical example is me full blown covid i was in itu caring for all these patients for 6 months not even a single day i was off sick not even a single cough cold flu fever anything when i had my antibody tested i was positive so at some stage i did have covid but i was completely asymptomatic but when i went if i was already asymptomatic i'm just talking only by personal experience if i'm already asymptomatic and i am taking a vaccine it is not going to cause any other issue other than having some pain um it is not going to aggravate covid symptoms because i already had covid i have not shown any symptoms by having covid vaccine i am not I, it is not going to aggravate any symptoms because i was already asymptomatic apart from niggle of pain and fever because of this injection because this injections are stored in such a low temperature uh, that could cause so i wouldn't say it would aggravate no it is a personal perception that's what i would say uh rosin again uh, there is another two more questions on the, the chat box uh, if you could be able to so one of them is if the patient with, has got pneumonia can they be immunized uh no it... you got to be physically very well for the 20, for four weeks you got to be physically well before taking the vaccine so if you are already having a pneumonia you got to recover from that pneumonia before getting vaccinated you got to be physically well to take the vaccine what is one other question um, if someone has tested positive this yes, uh, what what we do here in uk if or oh. what do we do in uk if someone has tested positive wouldn't get wouldn't be given the vaccine as a fifteen seconds so we don't agree okay if somebody has already had a covid vaccine there is a degree of antibodies in the body okay i agree on top of it um that is we don't know how long that is going to last already the studies have shown that the people who had covid vaccine their antibody level were declining if they were not in the healthcare setting so the in other words people like nurses and doctors and health care work health care workers if we were tested antibody positive because we are constantly exposed to these covid patients caring for them our immune system our antibody level stayed up but the public sector who were not exposed to these patients day in day out but they were tested positive and had an antibody but after 3 to 4 months their antibody level was declining so hence whether you had an antibody whether you had a covid or not you will go on to get vaccinated did i make sense yes, is that's what you were asking yeah i think i think i think that that answers yeah. the question but that studies have proven that uh, after covid contracting covid though they had an antibody their antibody levels were declining after 3 to 4 months if they were not if they were not working in a hospital environment so it's only proven that because we are constantly exposed to these patients our immune system our bodies 
our antibodies were remaining high, public sector was declining. So thank you, Rosalind. Is there anyone else has got any questions? One more question from me. Ma'am, uh, my intensive students who all are worked the first time in the COVID duty this year, nearly 40% students got the positive. Now, according to you, what are the uh, precautions now they're supposed to take? Now, already they are a positive. Out of 50, the 22 students now they are positive. Okay. How you could avoid getting COVID is, um, okay, have a good PPE, okay, in clinical practice. Personally, you got to take your own ownership as well. I know India is a sunny city, sunny country, and we really lack, um, what do you call, in England, we lack vitamin D. But considering being in India, my mom's vitamin D is much lower than mine. Okay? Which suggests that though you are in India, your vitamin D level is significantly low. Studies have proven that you've got to have a sufficient vitamin D and vitamin C in your body that, so that you're able to fight against this immune system and you're not able to gain this COVID or you're not contracting this COVID. So my suggestion is have a vitamin D supplements every day, despite you're in India. All the healthcare personnel, especially, I would strongly encourage that they have a vitamin D supplements. And also they can I, have, they can also have a vaccine now, can't they? If they have had it. Uh... Absolutely. If, 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 now the vaccine is open, so have the vaccination. And obviously you got to wait for 21 days to yeah. get your immune system up and running. For that 21 days, you are again at, at risk. But to avoid only is a good hand hygiene techniques, good PPE. And uh, when you're going home, remove all your clothing, have a good shower, keep all your clothing separate wash the clothing separately, dry it in a sunlight and have a good practice. See, I, I am living in a house where I have young children and a husband and all through the COVID, I was on my own. I was sleeping on my own. My clothing till today is washed separately, my, my hospital clothing. And I am taking vitamin D supplements every day and uh, vitamin C as well. So these are my personal experience I'm sharing. So we got to take ownership all through this COVID by God's grace. I didn't catch COVID, nor my husband, nor my kids. Because we all practice and we are very strict with our practice, what we do. Uh, sorry, uh, down here, from down here again, uh, I think Naresh has got some a couple of questions uh, which he posted on the uh, our WhatsApp group. Naresh? I think I've asked him that question. He asked already. Has he asked some more questions? Naresh? Oh, yeah, there is some more. No, sir. Same, same question, right? Nebulizer yeah. questions. Same question, sir. In okay, okay, okay. That's fine. I think Thank Nebulizer, you. I think he's mixed up. I think, uh, Naresh, I think, in the older machines, they are giving the, <clears throat> they connect the, instead of the, you uh, miss, they'll use the oxygen as a pressure to generate the uh, nebulization. So I think uh, instead of the, yeah, atmospheric care, they're using the oxygen pressure. So that can be given if they're using the older machine. Still, it won't be considered as the uh, OGP. Aerosol. Aerosol, Aerosol no, generated. Yeah. yeah. AGP. Aerosol AGP, generated. Yeah. So definitely, if, what will happen sometimes, they can't disconnect the oxygen if they're on the mask. Hmm. And uh, they can't give the, uh, they, they want to give the oxygen as well as the nebulizations together. Uh -huh. So but in that case, what they will do, they'll leave the, they will use the nebulization mask, but instead of connecting to the machine, they'll connect it to the directly to the oxygen, oxygen. source. Okay. So, okay. so that thereby patient will get both oxygen as well as the whatever the medication we are using. The, yeah, that's so that's okay. You. That's acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. One, one and the end thing, result will be the same. One thing you got to bear in mind, uh, Naresh, when you're administering oxygen, uh, nebulizer with oxygen, the maximum amount you could give is six liters uh, on, on the nebulizer. So if you got if you got a patient with ten liters of oxygen, so you can't put the nebulizer on a ten liter. That's so right. what you have to do is you have to put four liters on the nasal specs and six liters on the nebulizer mask. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Uh, do you guys have any other questions apart from non-invasive ventilation? Any, any, anything in terms of managing patients, 
any any difficulties that you're experiencing in terms of managing patients with COVID, uh, resource issues. No. Sorry. Sorry, go on, Rosalie. I just want to move my place because my daughter is starting her dance lesson and okay, she's okay. with <laughs> then are you finishing Ovi? She's looking at me already. So I just move with me. But okay. I can be connected. I'm still online. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry about that. No, you no, need... no. That's absolutely fine. It's okay. Rosalyn, thank you very much, Rosalyn. It was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's absolute pleasure. Thank you for having uh, me. Thank you, Gina, for giving me the mark. opportunity. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, go on. I'm sorry for uh, one more question I have. Yeah. Uh, men's, uh, that menstrual cycle period, we can get vaccination. It's any problem for them? Uh, I couldn't see any reason. There is no studies or there is no uh, reason given that during menstrual cycle, a person can't have a vaccine. No, it has nothing to do. Uh, vaccination is not going to make the periods to be more heavy. And... Um, uh, it uh, making you to have more abdominal cramps, not at all. Uh, there is no studies to say, or uh, it is not one of the question either. Uh, we have to complete a, a, a questionnaire before having the vaccine, and it is not given whether you are in your menstrual cycle or not. So it is not an issue during menstrual cycle whether you could have a vaccine or not. No, and also it doesn't show that during, uh, sorry, the vaccination is causing heavy periods or heavy PV bleed, no. Thank you. Right, so if you have no question, no more questions, uh, Suresh, I would welcome Suresh uh, to say the word of thanks. Right, um, excellent session. <laughs> I would say in one word. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, yeah, I would uh, really appreciate uh, with your um, <clears throat> effort and uh, coming to our GINA group and um, giving the good presentations. Uh, I'm sure everyone has enjoyed in this session. Uh, although we had some technical issues, I don't know, is it from our side or their side? So we had to rectify for that one. So, but um, Rosalind, uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, today. And I'm sure everyone has enjoyed your session. Uh, so, you, so you are grateful to you. So we hope to have some more okay. session with you. Uh, thank you very thank much you. Uh, on behalf of our Gina. Today. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it and hope it has been a valuable session. And uh, Swami, very special thank you to you for introducing me. Oh, no, no, no. It should be the other way around. It should be the other way around. <laughs> no, not at all. And uh, I really appreciate uh, taking me on board and uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to present the session. I really appreciate it. Well, you completed two or two long days, two consecutive long days, and you finished your work at 11.30 last night, and you still managed wow. to wake up, but you were the first That's one to log like in this morning. So, yeah. It's yeah, exactly. the, 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 No, it, this session was already, it has been planned for a while, uh, you know, but uh, the last minute, because of the COVID situations, uh, you really responded to our uh, request to you know uh, give some more the topic. information <laughs> uh, on COVID in the current situation you know it's really uh, grateful Helpful. and really nice to have you in no. our platform uh, thank you very much uh, most one more times uh, Rosalyn um, and again um, Swami uh, I have to thank you Swami as well other side because he, he brought many of his uh, you know friends or uh, the Julius or colleagues uh, on this our Gina platform so we had many wonderful sessions uh, so far. So thank you, Swami, again, uh, from Virginia. Yeah. Uh, and our audience, again, uh, it's very, it's very uh, you know, um, huge response, uh, to be honest. Uh, but our platform is a little bit uh, lesser this time. So we couldn't be able to accommodate everyone uh, for this session, uh, Zoom platform. But still, we offered for the... Uh, YouTube uh, live, so I'm sure people they watch on the YouTube as well. So thank you very much, uh, our participant for today's event, and also especially uh, Swami, which hospital uh, from the Bangalore? ANC Hospital. Yeah. AC, ACN is it? Uh, no, I mean oh yeah, Chest Hospital. Yeah, uh, from SDC the Bangalore. 
Yeah, yeah they, 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 their support is really appreciate, appreciated with their support. Uh, they have sent the circular to their, uh, you know, the whole team, including the doctors and nurses and all the teams, uh, they're asking them to, you know, attend this uh, event and use and get some benefit from this session. So I hope uh, they also join in various, uh, you know, uh, way uh, to for this session. Uh, very thankful to you as well. Um, and also many of the institutions, they have been registered for this event. Uh, um, the, uh, and again, uh, I, I would appreciate their uh, effort. And thank you very much for everyone uh, to join for this session. I just want to say one thing, if those who are unable to watch the sessions, if any of your colleagues ask for it, the recorded session is available online on the YouTube. So by all means, they can uh, watch the session in their own time. Uh, I know these are challenging times. If you guys have any questions, please do uh, uh, send a request in by email or by WhatsApp uh, to our Gina platform. I will be happy to share any of the informations. Thank you once again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you again, Rosalind. Thank you. Rosalind. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, I